You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to episode 123 of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Victor Marks, and joining me is Daniel Aaron Dilger. Hey, Victor. Hey, Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm glad to hear it. So there's a big event coming up next week. Yes, on Monday, Apple has their keynote for WWDC, and then for the rest of the week, there's packed full of sessions on things that are happening. What kind of things do we learn in those sessions? So the um, the first day, they have the keynote, which is public, and I kind of outline what they're... It's, it's more directed towards consumers and, and customers in general, and it's generally talking about software, what they're doing with uh, new products. The new release of iOS will be iOS 11 and whatever they call the next version of Mac OS. And Apple's also now talking about watch OS and TV OS as platforms. Um, and some of the other things they're working on. And then following that, they have a state of the, I call it state of the union, where they talk more in depth about uh, a lot of the technologies that they're working on and kind of giving a, a more of a roadmap of what's happening in the next, over the next year and kind of new foundational technologies that they're releasing or improving upon. And then for the rest of the sessions, you can usually see that in the WWDC app. Uh, there's several different things going on every day. For every hour block, there's a couple different uh, things you have to choose between seeing. And now, of course, they have everything videotaped, and it's all online and you know actually quite rapidly online, so you can you don't have to be as careful about what you're which session you're attending because you can see the other videos too. But so they, they cover everything from things like accessibility to uh, some of the new things they're working on. Um, that's where they discuss introductions, for example, like metal API for graphics, um, all kinds of things ranging from kind of basic technologies like the file system to uh, new things that they're promoting or, uh, and then, of course, there's labs, which is a really important thing for developers to be able to go and talk to the engineers that have built this software, the, found, the foundational um, platform that they're working on, and understand, uh, get firsthand information on some of the, pro- the problems they're running into and approaches to things. So it gives them an ability to speak with other developers and also engineers at Apple and get a better understanding of what's going on and also convey what their needs are to Apple. So it's a really great experience for all the, the developers that can attend. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that Apple likes to announce before this, this sort of thing is they, they, they try and gin up some little excitement for it. So they've announced that they have, since 2008, they have paid developers $70 billion since the iOS App Store launched. The increase in downloads is also at, they said, 70% higher than last year. Uh, yes. That's and pretty incredible. The, uh, but, but they noted, they, they called out a specific category of apps too, right? They said that photo and video app sales have surged 90%, which I thought was interesting that it's, uh, it's unusual for them to call it a specific category like that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they've, they've put a lot of, um, emphasis on the camera and that's one of the things that they're advertising yes, with iPhone seven is. is the portrait mode. I mean, they're really promoting that because that's one of the things that really stands out as different it's one of the things that the iPhone has that you can't get elsewhere. True. So what, what do you think is responsible for this 70% growth in downloads? Uh, well, the, the installed base just keeps getting bigger. I mean, people talk about how Apple's not selling more phones than last year, but uh, for the last three years, they've been selling the same number, generally, of phones that they sold with iPhone 6, which was a huge leap. So they, they sold a tremendous amount more. And, you know, most people don't buy a new phone every year. So that means they're finding that many customers again over and over again each year. And that is obviously increasing the install base because they're replacing, you know, three years ago it was iPhone uh, 5S was selling. So every time they sell another huge, you know, iPhone 6 group of phones, it's something like 200 million phones a year. So that's increasing the install base um, pretty dramatically. And all those people are learning to download more and more apps Definitely, and and it's uh, sort of fueled by both word of mouth and and also the uh, the App Store featured section, right? These are things that that people find out about and it highlights. They're making improvements. Because there's there's been some criticism of you know you go to look for an app and sometimes it's, it feels like kind of a mess that you're digging through, um, but they're they've been working to 
like you're saying, promote things specifically and also make groups of apps and, and uh, make it easier to find apps that people can make use of. Because for Apple, I mean, having you know software, they've known since the beginning of personal computers that software sells hardware. So if you have a lot of interesting, useful titles, then that's going to keep people going back to buy an iPhone. Definitely. Now, there was a, uh, a piece by a high-profile Apple stock analyst suggesting that basically all of Apple's upcoming hardware pipeline could be previewed at WWDC. Um, so I thought I'd bring this up so that we could poke fun at it and take, pick it apart a little bit. So this was a, an investor note from analyst Rod Hall of J.P. Morgan who said that he believes there's some possibility that Apple will preview the so-called iPhone 8 at the event. He, uh, he expected large form factor changes as well as 3D scanning features uh, as, as the reason to justify that kind of uncharacteristic preview. You know, normally we don't really see hardware well before it comes out unless there's something like the original iPhone that justifies that. Yeah, I believe that happened with iPhone 4. Was, was that a WWC? I'm not I sure can't remember the four's introduction. Because that was the year, 2010 was the year that they introduced the iPad at the beginning of the year. And it had the new A4 chip. And when the new iPhone came out, they, I believe they previewed it at WWDC. Because one of the things that Steve Jobs showed off was the, a, new, a new hardware feature was the uh, gyroscope. Yes. And describing it, you know, as a totally different form factor and they described it as being like a like a Leica camera. So because the previous, you know, the iPhone 3G and 3GS were sort of plastic, just designed to be basic mm -hmm. phones. And this was like, here's our here's what we want to do is make something that's really designed nice and looks like a really nice phone. So that was part of it. And the retina display, so, which required developers to be ready for that when that came out. Okay, so Hall says he believes that Apple will preview the iPhone 8 at the event. Do you think he's right or wrong? Um, I don't know. That's the only thing that I can provide as a previous time that that's ever happened. I mean, usually Apple comes out with stuff, they try to release it right when they show it. But there have been events where, for example, with Apple Watch, they showed that alongside the iPhone 6 launch, but it wasn't ready for another few months. But they wanted people to be thinking about it and thinking about Apple Pay and the connection between some of the stuff. So there could be some strategic reasons why they would release hardware there. Uh, I think the Power Mac was released at WWDC back in the day. And, of course, the um, Intel Macs were introduced in 05. Right. And in each case, in each case right, these, their, the reason was that they wanted developers to be familiar with the hardware and develop against it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it could be that there is photo, photographic, um, some of the 3D scanning stuff that there may be. I mean, it, it's possible. I don't think <laughs> there's a lot of things that I don't have to worry about too much. I mean, it's kind of fun to speculate out what's going to happen, but to like definitively say, yes, yeah, this is going to happen or no, it's not. I mean, it typically every year they say, oh, there's going to be all this hardware at WWC. And of course, there usually isn't. And so generally what we say is, right. yeah, this is not a hardware show. It's a developer conference for people that are writing software for Apple's platforms. But it, there, you know, it's possible that there could be hardware that is so important to uh, what developers are doing that they want them to be ready, that they would outline some of the, those things. But, you know, we don't know. On the flip side, I think it, it's probably more likely that we'll see things, uh, for example, um, there's been a lot of talk about what Apple's doing with the iPad. And I think with the new iOS 11, they're going to show off some more of their ideas of how existing iPads, not future iPad in, in general, but if they release software that shows, here's how you can use an iPad in a way that's um, maybe a further jump from the iPhone's version of iOS, so that it's more, conveys more of the power of what people are looking at for a notebook replacement, that could be something that um, gets shown off there before new iPads are, and you know, it's possible they could show the new iPad there. 
Mm-hmm. And that was that was Hall's next prediction, which is there's a reasonable chance that Apple will update the iPad Pro line at WWDC. Um, it kind of sounds like he's just it's just a shotgun going off. Like here's here's well, the things that they could show. <laughs> of course they could. <laughs> they could show yeah. an iPhone. They could show an iPad. The the Apple TV with a screen on it. It's probably not. But he he didn't say that as a screen. He he was just saying it's a, a new version of the Apple TV, which I think is plausible. Right. Um, with an A10 in it, you know, when the Apple TV fourth generation, the existing one, uh, first came out, it had the 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 A uh, was it A6. Whatever chip it was, it was from the, the previous no, year's No, the fourth call. generation is, is more A8. like an A8 or something. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's an A8. So today it sounds like A8 sounds older because even the entry-level iPhone SE has an A9 in it. I think everything they're selling right now has an A9. Um, so if Apple TV comes out, it, I would imagine it would have a, an A10 in it, which is a year old. And so it's cost-effective to put in a, a device, and it's very powerful. So he's he's calling this a 4K slash HDR version of Apple, Apple TV. And, you know, one of the, the reasons that he says that is because people want 4K, right? We have 4K televisions, we have, we have Netflix in 4K, but Apple doesn't have any 4K content available currently. So it's sort of a question as to whether or not we'll get one or whether or not it's even needed, really. Well, um, that, yeah, that, that would kind of go hand in hand. Kind of <laughs> the reason why they don't have software for it is because they don't have... Harder running 4K. Yeah. Uh, and the last one he, he picks up is the uh, the Pixon Siri, right? Uh, Hall says he expects to see new APIs for Siri this year, as well as new platform capabilities, uh, although he doesn't think that there will be an actual hardware product announced. And we've been talking about this idea of a Siri-based speaker. Um, you know, Bloomberg published a report saying that the Siri speaker is actually in manufacturing. Right. That says that it'll be announced in the keynote. Um, they said it could be. It, it was very right. iffy. I mean, one of the things uh, Gruber just wrote about, he was pointing out like, this, this whole <laughs> article that they wrote. on. <laughs> Gruber did a good line-by-line take apart of the story, basically. Yeah, I mean, there, there wasn't a lot there. And that's kind of what that's kind of what Mark Grimman does, is that he has one thing that he knows and writes a story of speculation around it. Which, you know, is understandable. I generally write just speculation, so <laughs> I can't fault them too much. But yeah, when it's it gets presented as like, oh wow, this is all news. It's like, no, most you know, most of what he's written has been written by other people. And he's just putting things together with this one nugget of you know, okay. how important is it that Apple's begun man- manufacturing something if you don't even know anything about it? <laughs> if we if we knew more about, you know, does it even have a screen or not, you know, that kind of thing. Is it is it going to be exactly? Oh, and whenever Apple any, comes out with something, everyone assumes that it's going to be a copy of whatever else is on the market. And generally, that hasn't been the case. The iPad wasn't like any other tablets. And there were tablets out there, like yes. Samsung was selling tablets. The iPhone was the same thing. Um, Apple's approach to you know Apple TV was it's comparable to other things on the market, uh, but it works differently. And uh, some of the, you know obviously Apple Watch. There were watches before, but Apple went in different directions with it. Um, so in terms of these these kinds of in-home uh, AI assistant speakers, there's the Amazon Alexa products, which are both with without screen and with screen. There's the Google Home variation of this, which is without a screen. There's the Essential one that was just announced that is screen-based. And that's kind of it, right? They're, they're, that's the field of this category. And... So far with Siri, with the the proposed Siri speaker that people talk about, um, you know, German claims that it won't include a screen. Ming-Chi Kuo wrote two weeks ago that the product will come with a touch panel. So those two things could be seen as being opposing. The They don't have to be necessarily because a touch panel doesn't necessarily have to mean a screen. It could mean just a panel in which you gesture. We don't really know. But... Um, it, but it's it's you know entirely possible that this is something that works a little differently and potentially a little better than any of those existing products. Right. One of the descriptions of it is that it's it's more like a seven point one surround system or something. Well, it's it's said to have. Let's see. So it could be a system have, with a whole bunch of uh, remote things all connected by no, Bluetooth or something. 
no, no, that's not, that's more of the description of what Essential is trying to do. The way that I'd understood this one is that it has one subwoofer and seven different tweeters, and that they're using it all in the same unit to create a virtual surround sound. Okay, I didn't catch that part. That, that's an that's interesting that's the issue concept. with these different kinds of reports is is you know uh, you you could read it written one way and then read it written another way and they're both coming off the same source information. It's not it, it really easy to tell until we actually have a product. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I, it, there's two things that are interesting. One is uh, the hardware. The, the other thing is, of course, Siri itself needs to get better. Um, there's a number of kind of very simple things. Some of the people that have been studying this and you know looking at how people actually use it and what people are actually using, you know, we, we know that Siri is overwhelmingly the most used. It's on the most devices by far. Um, there are the the stuff from Amazon and Google are often better at conversational things and understanding what's happening, giving you like something useful. And many times Siri just gets lost in the hallway. And there's a couple problems here. One is Siri understanding, being able to parse what you're saying. The other is Maps search is still awful. It's absolutely yeah. awful. And you can search for things in Maps. And it's kind of strange because when you search with Spotlight on the phone, if you do like a general search, sometimes it will find things that if you go into Maps and search for the same thing, it will just act like it has no idea what you're looking for. And it's very frustrating. It's like, how are there two search engines on the phone? And um, so I think that's one of the things that Apple is really going to be working on in this release is pulling stuff together and making it work better when you search, especially with voice. And searching with voice or, or having like a command line, the, they should both be in the same system and should work similarly. And that's not the case right now. Uh, but that kind of unification is is one of the things that's difficult to do. And that's why these things have developed separately. Now, what I've also noticed is that Siri has uh, different behaviors with different accents. For example, I, I have a friend who tried to use Alexa and found that it could not understand him. And hidden in Alexa's app, there's a method for training it so that it understands your accent. Right. But fresh out of the box, it did not understand him at all. Um, going on just having people speak with accents at these devices straight out of the box... Google Home was actually the best among all of them at understanding what you intended it to understand. Alexa was the absolute worst. And Siri was was about 60-40, 60, 40, 60 in, in favor of getting it right, um, depending on, on the question, of course, you'd asked and how bad the accent was or how strong the accent was, rather. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been trying to see how people do with these things and how they, they get on with them. And what I've found so far is that the overwhelming use of the speakers that are out there, the Alexa and the Google ones, is that people use them firstly to listen to music streaming services, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, um, and in the case of Alexa, Amazon Music, or in the case of, of Google, it's either uh, YouTube Music or Google Play Music. Um, then people use them for timers and reminders and lists, which fits in with my use of Siri primarily anyway, right? 99% of my, my Siri use is... Uh, setting timers followed by sending messages by voice or followed by adding things to a list in notes. Um, and after that, the home automation stuff falls and it's, it's sort of a distant third. People are using these things to listen to music and to, to do timers and reminders kind of things. And the, the kind of things you would casually ask somebody else to do. That's right. that what, that's what makes sense with a voice system. And there's, there's a lot of demos where they're like, hey, make a reservation for me at this time. And, you know, I want to be in a child-friendly restaurant that serves, you know, flautas or something. But people don't really need to do that. And if you really, well, if you really want to set that up, you probably want to do it differently. You probably want to go online and search through what restaurants are available or something. I mean, that's how I would do it. I, but, I mean, people have different ways of... The other thing Siri is good at <laughs> that is kind of actually useful is if you're doing math. You can just rattle off a bunch of numbers. Like if you were adding a bunch of statistics together, it's really mm -hmm. quite good at that. And I find that actually Siri's ability to understand what I say, and I'm not you know, the clearest speaker, but Siri's ability to understand what I'm saying is, that is often very good. The things that fall down are when you ask for either some kind of general question about things, and it all, all it gives you is a web page kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I wish there was better integration with... Uh, what is it? The 
I'm thinking Mathematica, but that's not right. Uh, you're thinking of Wolfram Alpha. Yeah, Wolfram Alpha. If, if, if that presented things better. Or if, if Siri said was more like Google search results, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I said Siri. Here's, here's what I found on the web as opposed to uh, just yeah. would you like to search the web kind of thing. Like, I, yeah, it sounded like you said this. Are you looking for this answer or this kind of thing? Or you know, yeah. were, were you looking for sports scores? If you could respond more conversationally, I think that would be smart. And that would so, that would greatly increase the usability and use cases. But the 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 rumor about what this thing has in terms of speakers, the 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 woofer and the tweeters and all of that, makes it sound like they're making it going to be a good speaker for music, which yeah, is a very smart decision. Smart. Yeah. The other thing that I hope they do, um, and, and it seems to me that they should because it fits with their vision, right? So with, with Google Home. If you have a Google Home speaker and you have a Chromecast set up both within your, your Google account, you can tell Google Home with, with the syntax. You can say, okay, Google, play whatever to from, from audio source to my Chromecast. So I have a Chromecast that I've named TV because the Chromecast is connected to the TV. And I can say, okay, Google, play um, Oingo Boingo from YouTube on my TV. And it'll send the either the music video or it'll just send the music and play it on the TV through the good speakers. Does that seem to work for you? It works brilliantly. It works every time. So my experience with Chromecast, being familiar with using AirPlay, which just works yeah. flawlessly. AirPlay, you're basically saying, send whatever's playing on my phone to another device. Um, yeah. Chromecast is, I think it works by you're saying, basically, here, go to this web page and stream this directly, and the phone is not even involved. And so I've had yeah, to use so that at a friend's house. And I, I notice I'm playing like, you know, HBO now or something. And when you set up Chromecast, it takes longer for it to set up. It's like this kind of slow plotting thing. And then if you want to change, if you want to pause playback or stop it or anything, there's no control. And it, it's, right. it's a terrible Chrome, interface so and it's difficult and I don't like here, it. Here's, here's how this works, right? With AirPlay... The the source is coming from the internet into the phone, and then the phone is rebroadcasting it to the the AirPlay receiver, TV speaker, whatever. And you have control over it because it's coming through the phone. So that's where your pause, play, and controls are. With Chromecast, you are directing from the phone the Chromecast go to that URL and stream this piece of media. And then Chromecast sends back the play pause controls to the phone. But because it's doing it that way, there's a bit of the lag when you're going to the phone. It's slightly better on Android phones, I've noticed, although not perfect. But the relationship between home and Chromecast is perfect. When I say, okay, Google, pause the TV, it does. And it does it without lag. It does it without delay. So that part is actually better than using the phone as the remote for Chromecast. It's really, really sweet to be able to sit at the couch and just say, okay, Google, play Netflix, play Stranger Things from Netflix on the TV, and it queues up the episode and plays. And it just works, and it works brilliantly. What I'm hoping is that Apple remembers, remembers AirPlay and will be able to use this speaker for music, but also be able to tell it by voice to direct AirPlay to other devices. Yeah, that'd be smart. I mean, one of the things with Siri is it doesn't seem to currently um, know the matrix of your devices that Apple does know. I mean, when you register all your machines, you know, you can go to find my iPhone and, you know, you can find your Mac on it. it it's like everything is connected and knows what, what's going on. And there's a lot of, uh, the, you know, the connectivity stuff that, yeah. Uh, but I think right now Siri doesn't know how to do things like you can't say play this through my mac well they have they have two problems right because there's the devices that are registered in find my iphone but there's also the devices that they detect when but using uh, zero conf which is uh, bonjour that's how they detect which airplay devices are actually on your network when you use the airplay menu and then they've got names in there like iphone and apple tv and so forth and so you have to know the names of your devices to be able to tell them to do it by by voice. What I'm hoping they get to, so so we're talking about sending media to a single device, which is cool, but one of the problems that hasn't really been addressed well is the idea of whole house audio for those cases when you want to play on more than one device. 
Yeah, it's that, kind that of should be something that home play or home kit does. Yeah, and it's yeah. something that hasn't really been handled yet. The the beats you can get the beats pill. You can get like yeah. two beats, and there's an app on your phone that will stream stereo to both of them, so you actually have a stereo field, or you can have. So they have that kind of in the works, but yeah, that would be one of the things I would vote for too, is having having a smart home where you have music playing in different rooms and it's all cloud connected and smart. It, it certainly should be. You know, that's one of the things that's been missing from Amazon Alexa is that there's Alexa at the Amazon Fire TV and there's Alexa in the speakers, the Echo speakers, but the Echo speaker Alexa has no awareness that you have the Fire TV, even though they're both registered in the Alexa app on the phone. So you, you can't send media from one to the other or, or do a Chromecast kind of arrangement where you tell one to do something to the other. You know, It is interesting that there's, there's some things that are very simple that people are very impressed with that are actually quite easy to do, <laughs> like the way something looks, you know, this, the design of a window or something. Um, yeah. Then there's things that are very difficult to figure out how to solve. And those kind of things seem simple to a lot of people if you're not a technical user. And there's a lot of things to me that when you look into how it actually works, and you're like, oh, wow, of course, that has to be that complicated because it has to take in consideration all these things you wouldn't normally think about. But there's a lot of things when you're using a product, you think, man, I wish it would just do this. It's like if you've, if you've ever done product management for a group of people or a client, you know, and they're like, yeah. hey, I know that we're like 99% finished, but could you just do this one little tweak that would require you to change everything in the product? Yeah, and it's your responsibility as a product manager to say no. Yeah, we can't do this one little tiny thing because it's actually not tiny. It's, it's enormous. It's 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 not in the product design spec. It's there was no feature request. It's not uh, there's no change request. There's nothing approved. No, we're not stopping the train for this. <laughs> yeah, but for for a lot of people, it's like it's difficult to get that across sometimes, and they think, oh, I just want this one little thing. I just no, <laughs> no, you can't have that. But but the speaker, this idea of a series speaker ticks a lot of boxes for me when I you know we, we talk a, a little bit from time to time about how does this fit into the overall vision for Apple well it, it fits in because it's within the home and fits in with an idea of home kit addressing needs within the home right it fits in within the the vision of people using airplay it fits in within the vision of people using Siri it fits in within the vision of people using Apple music Right, it, it it ticks a lot of boxes across different categories of things that Apple wants to do. It'll be interesting to see how ambitious they are with it, and if there's any reason. I mean, Apple got into Wi-Fi was one of the first people that was offering um, Wi-Fi when it first came out. Yeah. Yeah. Debuted on the iBooks, I think, <clears throat> and you know they had this whole franchise of AirPlay or um, airport base stations. And then they just sort of put it on hold and it went away. And they didn't announce it that it was canceled, I don't think. They just kind of sidelined it and it just kind of disappeared. So it would be interesting to see if that's really something they think other people should just handle or whether they're going to include well, that. Well, so in the question, I mean, so here, here's the thing about the the airports, right? When they launched the airport and the airport express later on, they were trying to solve how difficult Wi-Fi was to set up at the time, and it really was difficult. You know, you had to go to Cisco school to be able to set up a Wi-Fi yeah, network properly. it was properly. much more difficult, yeah. And now that largely everyone else has followed their steps with good setup assistance and apps on the phone that make it easy to set up, there's less of a need, uh, especially since they've allowed third parties to be able to plug in USB hard drives and use hard drives connected to, th- to, to non-Apple routers as time machine backups. There's less of a need for these kinds of of base stations to come from Apple directly. Perhaps. Um, there's also some really interesting things Apple could do if they had control of a network and were able to use a variety of technologies. I mean, you know, Bluetooth 5 is coming out and doing more a combination. I mean, Bluetooth keeps getting better at both working faster and making use of Wi-Fi to send data and also doing very low power. Is, is it Zigbee kind of related stuff? I can't remember what the name of it is, but it was Bluetooth 4 for small devices. So getting more efficient uh, and faster. BLE. Yeah, it was something. It was like a separate standard that kind of folded into into the Bluetooth standard. Yeah, that, that was BLE. 
but the uh, with the emerging different technologies coming out, um, there could be interesting things that are doing. And also, you know, they used to have the router, and when you control a router, you are able to uh, facilitate things like remote access to your devices, and you could do things that you'd normally use a server for. I have a caching server or something. It always seems terribly wasteful to me to update a couple different iOS devices and you're you're downloading the same apps over and over again and the same OS updates and I don't know how much yeah. of that could be. But if you download server to your Mac, if you if you put the OS ten server stuff on your Mac, you can use your Mac as the caching yeah, server. Then you need a Mac cache. and yeah, you need all those things to set up. Right. So it may not be practical right. but I, the other thing I think is that Apple is moving away from selling the routers because the idea is to sell devices that have a primary purpose for you and then also do things in addition to that, right? The Apple TV, they, they didn't make a separate HomeKit bridge. They made the Apple TV, and by the way, it's your HomeKit bridge. Right. Right? So so having to sell a router that's a router is kind of antithetical to that. If they sold the Apple TV, and by the way, it acts as the router, or it acts as your caching server. You know, that's that's more in line with where I think they're going. Will be interesting to see what they do. It will. How do you think the idea of a Siri speaker, like we've talked about, and, and knowing that it's total speculation, um, affects Apple's market position? Because Alexa is kind of the big one in the, ho- the, the house right now. If you look at okay. the number of Alexa home things that have been sold, they've only sold yeah. like 10 million of them in the last since 2014. I mean, it's not a huge installed base. It's, there's a lot of people that really like them. Right, but there's a lot and of stuff that goes along with those. There's right? a lot of Phil things that can be. And there's all a the lot of things stuff. that can be used with them. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe the hue bulbs, and that's probably popular to set up. But um, yeah, I, if if it if you that think, is you, you the think case, HomeKit's if, doing a lot better than it is. If, if that is the case, if you're talking about like actual numbers of what's selling, mm-hmm. um, that would be interesting because it means Apple's not doing a, a good of job as marketing it. Um, that's what I'm telling you. Yeah. Apple is not doing a great job at HomeKit. I'm trying to think in my personal <laughs> experience, how many people I have, I know that, that use them. I, you know, I'm in San Francisco and right. I, I know a couple of people that have things, but I don't see people buying a lot of that. And, um, yeah, I haven't seen the market data for it. So, but, yeah. but what, what I have heard is, you know, when, when Amazon came out with it and they're announcing how many partners they have and they're announcing how many people they have online that are ready to do stuff. That sounds to me more like where those numbers are coming from. It's like how much, how many participants you have. Yeah, but uh, I, I'm I'm saying that Apple is is uh, not doing as good a job at getting people interested and doing a good job of marketing HomeKit as as the others are. Uh, and I'm I think part of it is this. Go ahead. I think part of it is Apple is finishing HomeKit because they just it's only been out for what two years. Mm-hmm. Is it older than that? Because they sort of came out with it, and then last year they came out with a home app, and it was actually an interface that you saw, and you're like, oh, yeah, I can use this. And um, they're kind of like laying ground ground technology to do things, where Amazon's approach is quite diff- different in that they're selling a device that says, hey, this is a fun thing to put in your house. And then they're ready to sell you more stuff. So, I mean, Amazon is a seller of products, where Apple is more, they're selling you higher and specific devices of, you know, you're getting your watch there and you're getting your phone, you're getting your computer. But um, it's probably less obvious that to buy this other stuff until they get it rolled out to the point where it's like, here's a store. I think that would change how, yeah. how things are being bought. Right. My, my conjecture is that the speaker is definitely something that they're it's a good thing that they're doing that it's going to further adoption of some of the other things especially if it acts as kind of a hub for different technologies i mean if it can connect to things because right now i had a number of different home things i'm in the process of moving so everything's been in boxes but um i had insteon and i had the which is for switches and dimmers and things like that um and then i had the philips lights which i think are directly home kit Yes. So, so there's a couple of different groups of things you can buy that um, they're not home kit devices themselves, maybe, but they connect to a bridge that makes them all work with Siri and HomeKit. 
So, and part of the reason for that is all these companies had existing technology using various different approaches to create a wireless mesh between the devices or whether it was all like spokes to a hub device. And what Apple brought was let's make it really easy and let's also make it very secure. And that also had, adds a layer of expense because if you just kind of slop stuff out there, it's cheaper. And one of the things that um, the platform that Samsung bought, there's security problems with it. And when you install a bunch of devices in your home that are talking to each other, and it's possible for somebody else to like remotely control those things or listen on you, I mean, that's kind of a big problem. And that's something that a lot of companies don't think about until it explodes into a problem, and then they have a platform on fire that they're trying to fix. Yes. So I think Apple was right in trying to do it correctly before they start promoting it. Okay, so you're saying that we have yet to see the promotion happen for it. Yeah, I mean, they haven't been pushing it hard because a lot of it isn't finished yet, I think. Okay. That's, that's interesting. But they're, start, you know, they're starting to promote things. And one of the things that they promoted in the, the recent um, Accessibility Awareness Week was they were showing, you know, here's this guy that has an entire house, and uh, it's not just to be fancy, it's to make it accessible. So he can, like, walk into a room and turn the lights on because he can't physically turn it on himself. And so now he has the ability to do that. And so it's empowering to people who have specific needs. And in, in addition, that empowers the rest of us to also have the same kind of thing. So it, promoting it in that sort of sense is, is an interesting way to show off products and capabilities. Definitely. I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we published an article about the Swift Playgrounds app. And Apple revealed that there's yeah. a new version coming that's going to come at the beginning of WWDC that will allow people to write programs against drones, robots, and other electronics. Yeah, super cool. Have you used Swift Playgrounds? Yeah, I, I ran through all the... There's like a series of... I think they keep adding ones too. And it's kind of designed as a a playground of where you kind of write a... It's almost like an ebook that's in code, but it, it gives you a playground to develop in a protected sort of thing. So you're, you're creating part of a program and it's showing you the output of it. And so you, you see what you're doing. So it's kind of like a sort of an erector's kit for software. So working with other companies, like they're working with Lego, I guess, and being able to interface directly with other devices is a real practical way to teach kids and get kids excited about programming. And yeah, building software. The Lego, the Lego kit is particularly cool because people use the Lego kit to teach robotics in schools. And the code has traditionally been a Scratch-based kind of code, which is uh, MIT Scratch language where you assemble blocks by just physically arranging puzzle pieces of blocks in the, the software. And to to teach it to write Swift is is very cool because now you're, you're teaching a language that has broader applications than Scratch. Yeah. And you're teaching kids um, to think in terms of building software and creating and programmatic machines, too, basically. Scratch. scratch gets used a lot when uh, Google, when Apple does the Hour of Code sessions in their stores. But uh, Swift is, is sort of like the step beyond that. Once you've done Scratch, what do you do next kind of thing. And it's interesting because it kind of parallels some of the other things we've been talking about that um, anybody can throw out a, a new programming language. But to really make something work, you have to think a lot about what you want it to be and what you want it to accomplish. And it takes a lot of working with people and understanding, you know, is this going to serve your needs? And, I mean, Apple is potentially the biggest user of Swift, but they don't actually use it a lot. They can't use it yet in um, Mac OS, for example. They can't write it in Swift because it's not quite finished yet. I mean, it's still in this progress of getting done. So to make bigger use of it, they're making sure that everything is stable and ready to go. And it'll be interesting to see how, how quickly Apple converts more of its own code to using Swift to modernize it and to make it safer and faster. Do you think that's a part of their overall vision? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what they did it for, to modernize things. I mean, um, some of the you know, key features of Swift is that it, it's fast and easy and easy to understand, easy to maintain, easier to maintain. And also, um, it can be, it can be optimized by a machine compiler easier. And it's less, it's harder to build things that 
add, for example, leak memory or do things like that. So it's safer. Better behaved software. So, yeah. So for Apple to, to create a product and the approach that they make to it, um, it really puts uh, confidence for other people to, to use it and um, invest in it. Because Apple is really a platform company. I mean, we think of Apple as being a hardware company, but anybody can make hardware. Um, what Apple is doing interesting with their hardware, there's a lot of things that are proprietary with their hardware in terms of building custom chips that are tuned to do specifically one task, not designed for you know commodity for everyone to use in various different ways. Um, so there's that benefit that Apple has in terms of building hardware. But a large part of the value of Apple's platform is software. But it's it's all kind of tied together in a platform. And Apple makes a kind of the biggest deal about that's what WWDC is all about. It's like here's our platforms and we're helping people to, you know, basically the stand on the shoulders of giants kind of thing. We've already done the the ground software and you're building on top of it doing your interesting creating th- creative thing without having to do all the stuff that's already been done in terms of the operating system and the frameworks and you know being able to connect to a wireless device or you know control something with HomeKit or something like that. We've we've already done those things. You can do something interesting on top. Yeah. Well, so Lego, Parrot, Sphero, Ubtech, Wonder Workshop, and Skoog are all electronics makers that are working with Apple for Swift Playgrounds to to be incorporated in terms of content. And it's it's not just that you'll be allowed to do basic things with these things, but that, that it will also serve as a blank slate. So you'll be able to build custom controls. You can fly a Parrot drone. You'll be able to specify yaw, pitch, and roll changes in your code. Yeah. So this That's is kind really of powerful cool. stuff. It is. And when you see what people are doing with drones, we think of it as just being kind of like a you know fun thing to fly around, take pictures. But there's a lot of industrial things that are happening with drones. For example, maintenance and also in agriculture, you can fly a drone over and you get a sense of you know if there's anything wrong with your crops, and you can map things out. And um, there's a lot of really powerful things you could do if you had a fleet of drones that you could manage. And well, so that's it, managing really one cool drone feature. is interesting enough. If you can manage multiple drones, right? If you can manage a, a true fleet, now you've got something really interesting. Um, but this is this is. You know, this is the app that they set out and said, hey, let kids do it, right? And this is how you enable everyone from, you know, 10 to ten to 100 to be able to do more. Um, they've also got a, a whole curricula for a year-long course that's available through the iBook store that even some colleges and high schools are teaching starting in the fall. So you can, you can work through it at your own pace and do playgrounds and also do the course. And uh, it, it's, it's really amazing how all the resources out there it's it's not as hard as it had used to be to figure out how to become a developer yeah that's really cool that they're building stuff like that i've always wished apple would take a more of a leading role in teaching people how to program because they've always had you know guidelines and developer documentation but it's very difficult if you don't know anything about development to get started without starting with somebody else's technology. You know, you learn Java, and then you learn C++, and then after you spend all this time learning generic stuff, then you can start to learn how to develop for Macs. But um, I think they're working really hard at making it so that you can just, like, walk up and here's an iPad, and here's a free application that learn you learn how to develop using the language of iOS, or what's going to be. So that's a yeah. really cool development. And and I think it works well for for Apple in terms of their future, right? That's it's how they get the uh, developers they need, not for tomorrow, but for you know five years from now. There's a lot of talk about automation, how jobs are going to go away for automation, and we're not going to have people driving cars because you know a computer can do it better. But mm-hmm. we're going to have people to develop that automation, and I, I don't see as much emphasis being put on the fact of we need to teach people how to automate. We need to teach young people how to automate. We need to teach people who have jobs that you know are not going to be relevant in the future how to do something that is going to be relevant in the future. And I think there's there hasn't been enough attention to that. Well, there's there's this theory that through automation and through artificial intelligence, we're going to get computers that program themselves. But I, I feel like that even when that comes, there is still going to be a need for developers because... Yeah, the need might change. Yeah. To it, right? There's a human element to understanding. Like we were talking about product requirements at the beginning and adding features. There's a human element to understanding the product requirements and understanding a specification 
and interpreting it correctly. That when you communicate with a computer, they may or may not, it may or may not understand you perfectly. But when you communicate with a person, you can hone in on and refine that, right? There's, there's something about still going to definitely be a need for human development. Yep. The world is, keeps going faster and faster. The older you get, the harder it is to keep up. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> well, wow, this is much easier when I was younger. You, you say, you keep saying that grandpa, I'll be over here with the young kids. Um, the, this is an interesting one. Um, so we've talked in the past episodes about how Apple has sort of this uh, legal battle going on with Qualcomm over royalties that Apple is not paying or, or Apple is concerned about overpaying based on the royalties that their factories are supposed to be paying Qualcomm. And in that context, uh, Apple is said to be ramping up the use of Intel's modems for the supposed iPhone 8 instead of using Qualcomm's modems as they have been in the past. The uh, the article that we have here says that the proportion rose... So Intel supplied 30% of Apple's iPhone 7 chips. The proportion has since risen to about 50% across new iPhones in 2017. And there's some suggestion that that ratio could go as high as 70%. Yeah, there's a couple factors. I mean, there's a couple reasons why those that ratio is changing. One is that the Intel chips that they came out with originally, it was, what was the rebranding of Infion that they bought? Infion used to make the iPhone modem chips up until mm-hmm. the Verizon iPhone came out. And to be able to support Verizon and other carriers that have CDMA technology that's basically owned by Qualcomm, they had to license Qualcomm chips. They had to buy Qualcomm chips. So they're either buying them directly or Qualcomm is selling them to the people who are assembling iPhones. Right. And um, there's like a lot of weird patent things. Like if you remember, shortly after Apple switched to to uh, Qualcomm, Samsung came back with one of their patent lawsuits against Apple and said, "Hey, you were using these Infion chips before, and we licensed our technology to Infion, but we didn't license it to you. And so now you're going to have to pay us again for the chips that you're using. That that's they got thrown out. But they were trying to get an injunction based on that." And mm-hmm. this is called patent exhaustion, I think. And so that's that kind of plays into it too. Is is it's not only who it's not only that you're you're paying to license someone else's technology, but there's all these layers of if you're buying chips that are finished, do you own the technology? I mean, are, are you allowed to use the chip that you just bought, or do you have to pay a fee on top of it? And Qualcomm, their whole business model is you know a lot of their money is coming from licensing, and so um, if you're if you're in control of the t- technologies that everybody else is using, and because they've made CDMA and LTE is based on CDMA type technologies, um, the entire world has to use your technology. So they deserve to get paid for what it's worth, but they're very creative in coming up with hoops to jump through. And this whole idea that you know they sell Apple however many chips, but then they refund them billions of dollars if they're only using their chips. And they're kind of skirting a lot of laws in terms of, you know, preventing monopoly abuse and things like that. Um, and they've been fighting, Qualcomm's been fighting a, a bunch of companies. They've been fighting uh, the FTC in several different con- countries. Um, they're fighting Chinese companies that want to use their chips without paying for them. And, you know, now they're fighting Apple and they had a problem with BlackBerry and it, there's all kinds of problems because they have such, it's very complex and it's not just a simple thing of, you know, Apple's not paying or Apple doesn't want to pay them. And, and at the same time, Apple also doesn't want to pay them. You know, if, if any company can do things that they don't have to pay to license someone else's technology, if they can figure out a different way to do it, that's another thing. But the, the difference in the ratio that we're talking about, when they started with the iPhone 7, um, they were using the Intel chips only in iPhones 7s that were designed for use with um, AT&T and T-Mobile and other mm-hmm. carriers that don't need to use CDMA or don't use it. Um, whereas I wrote about in February this new chip that they came out with that I presumably licenses Qualcomm's technology, but it does everything that Apple would need to do to work on different carriers. Right, that's the XMM7560 LTE modem you're talking about. Yeah, they announced that in, at the beginning, like toward the beginning of the year. And um, 
So that would allow Apple to use more chips. It, of course, at the same time, whether Apple's using Intel or Qualcomm is also based on what kind of prices each one wants to give and things like that. So it's kind of similar with the chip production from Samsung LSI or um, Taiwan Semiconductor. Right. And I think Apple has a long institutional memory for having been held hostage to one provider. You know, the uh, all the way back to the PowerPC days, right, where, where the G3 or the G4 only came from Motorola or only came from IBM. And being stuck with, with one provider and their whims or their un- inability to provide updates or supply um, burned them in, in a way that they're never going to forget. Well, I mean, then they went to Intel and they're only getting it from Intel. And they've never they've never signaled any interest in using chips from, you know, AMD or something else. Yeah, but they've also never been burned so badly by Intel that it's been a big consideration. And if they wanted to do it at AMD, they could in a heartbeat. It wouldn't be that big a recompile. It's already getting burned by the fact that Intel's not making chips faster anymore. Yeah, but none of the AMD chips would help them get there either. Right. right? I mean, AMD doesn't have a, a, a Ryzen that can do... 32 gig of, of low power memory. So yeah, I guess my what I'm saying is, it it's not just. I mean, having having a sort of stuck with one provider is a problem. Yeah, the, Apple would prefer to have multiple op- options because that allows for both better prices and also competition for ideas. If somebody comes up with a better something that works better, then you can jump to using that. So it's like with GPUs going back and forth between. Um, I guess it's AMD and NVIDIA. Yes. And with yes. Macs, they went back and forth and back and forth, depending on who was offering something better or, or that integrated with whatever they were using made the most sense or for whatever reason. Like the new MacBook Pros that the is it the AMD chips, they support multiple 5K displays just because of the way that they're designed. Yes. yes. Is that correct? I think that is. So having options to not necessarily Intel may may give them some things that Qualcomm won't. And at the same time, they're also in this licensing issue that I think is also separate. I mean, whether they're buying chips from Qualcomm or not, if they're using those technologies, they want to make sure that they're licensed in a fair way and that Apple isn't paying, isn't forced to pay more than anyone else pays just because they're selling more expensive phones. Right. So if you have a, 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 basically a Qualcomm chip, costs more for Apple than for, you know, somebody making an iPhone copy because they're selling their copy for less because they put less effort into it. And that doesn't seem to be fair. I mean, it's easy to understand their argument there. Yeah, well, it's it's that argument. And it's also the uh, being asked to pay twice, right? It's the, the their factory got charged. And now they're also being asked to pay. Yeah. Is the license paid for or not? Right. Right. And also, it's like, are are you just going to give us the price because we're buying all your chips? Or are you going to make whoever's assembling our parts pay more than anybody else would pay just because you have the ability to twist their arm when you couldn't get that kind of money from us? Yeah. So there's a bunch of issues involved. On the flip side of that, um, Sony is is said to be giving priority to CMOS sensor production to Apple forcing other vendors to source smartphone camera elsewhere. The the idea here is that Sony's been a long supplier for years for the cameras for iPhones, and Apple is Sony's largest customer for them. Uh, and in fact, historically, I think there was a time where there was a storm in Japan and camera production slowed down, and, and the iPhone, as a result, also slowed down production because they were waiting on cameras from Sony. Uh, so basically, Sony is prioritizing uh, Apple's production and deprioritizing anyone else. Yeah, that's happening kind of across the board. I mean, that's been happening since the iPods were using up so much RAM or hard drives or whatever components that um, they're changing a shift in the market. And Apple had the money to go in and say, "Yeah, we're gonna we'd like to buy seventy billion dollars worth of <laughs> whatever component." So yeah, you can line up contracts that make it harder for another company to run out and say, hey, we'd like a very small number of these premium components. It's like, sorry, we've already committed them to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And and this happens where, because Apple is such a big customer for Sony, that when Apple changes their orders, it, it basically impacts Sony's bottom line. 
uh, in January 2016, 2016, last year basically, uh, Kenichiro Yoshida said, he's the Sony CFO, he said that certain customers ordered fewer CMOS image sensors in, in the, the, uh, the final quarter of 2015, forcing a 13% drop in quarterly sales, contributing to a huge quarterly loss there. Um, so yeah, when, when you're that big a customer, when you've got that much supply coming from, from one vendor, you really do impact what that vendor's bottom line looks like. And especially with Apple, because Apple makes tons of the same thing. If you compare it with Samsung, Samsung makes, what, twice as many phones? They ship is that, that, that many more in terms of volume. But they're making literally tens of thousands of different machines. I mean, and each one of them is different. You're, you're, you're talking about the SKU lineup versus the amount they turn out, right? Right. So that 80 million phones or however many phones they, they produce. Um, across 15 SKUs as opposed to being across four SKUs. Like thousands, actually thousands of SKUs. I mean, they have all these different models. It, even when you have a brand name, if you say like Galaxy S7, there's something like 40 different versions of it. Right. And some of those are just carrier versions and some of those are regional versions. Yeah, they have, where different, they have chips, different cell different components. Modems and yeah. Things, yeah. yeah, it's pretty incredible. So for Apple, I mean, there's there's cases where, like we were talking about the Qualcomm Intel modems, that's one machine with two different parts depending on how it's going to be used. And in some cases, you know, Macs will have hard drives from this company or that company, whatever Apple has. But in general, Apple has a pretty high spec, I mean, like higher end components that they don't mix from different suppliers in many cases. And so, yeah, you have... On, on Apple's end, you have to have one supplier that can make a tremendous number of the same thing very consistently. And so for the supplier, that means that you have this huge order coming in. You have to actually dedicate your production for that. And for them, it's often better because um, if you look at, for example, the chips that Apple is using, I mean, they're making their own now, but um, if you compare that to other devices that there's been a series of things that flopped, you know, Microsoft came out with various phones. Um, there were, you know, Palm came out with stuff that there was like a bunch of different companies that were trying to make leading phones kind of like essential today, you know, this year, Andy Rubin's company where he's coming out with this phone that looks kind of like the next iPhone and it's being introduced first, but how many can he possibly sell? It's going to be like a Nexus phone. Well, his his market is the same people that buy a Pixel or buy a Nexus, exactly. right? It's it's a, the people who want to spend six hundred, seven hundred dollars. It's a Pixel outside on of a Google premium and it's Android the same phone, kind of impact, right? Oh, right, yeah. And it, it's not only like understandably small market, but what I'm saying is when you have something that you just can't take to market and expect to sell, you know, hundred million of them, then it changes the volume that you can expect to buy and. Apple is in this very enviable position where not only do they make a lot of devices, but they can basically create anything. And if they do it right, they're going to sell in a guaranteed huge amount of numbers. And that's why these narratives, like you know, talking about Apple Watch and trying to just it, trying to say that it was a failure, like really repeatedly trying to create this message that Apple Watch is failing, and it wasn't. I mean, that's not true. And Apple wasn't trying to say that it. They weren't trying to create a message that it wasn't failing. They weren't saying, here's our numbers, because they were very specifically saying, we're not going to tell our numbers, which is what every other company does. Nobody else says, we sold this many of something and reports it every year in their SEC filings. Yeah. So, But you, you can be kind of reasonably on, so assured that if Apple is putting all the effort, on. that they're going to sell in huge quantities where other startups can't do that. So it's harder to get the parts yeah. for them, but... Yeah, and I don't think the Apple Watch was a failure by any stretch of the imagination. The The difficulty with Apple Watch has been uh, refiguring out what the watch is supposed to be, and Apple keeps changing that a little bit. Yeah, exactly. That's what they should be doing. That's, well, how, that's yeah. how evolution works. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> well, that and, and, and refocusing like, it work? when they discover, work? you know, yeah. originally it was for medical, and now it's for fitness, and now it's for the, you know, but they're, they're learning, right? They're, they're learning and evolving what that device can be. I think the and, biggest shift was messaging, because they, they really put a lot of effort into sending messages and sending taps and sending your heartbeat, and, and people didn't really use that, in part because it, it would require kind of a installed base that was yeah. bigger than yeah. existed. So they kind of changed that to, oh, now you're using that button for multitasking or whatever it does. Exactly. Yeah. But they've been learning. And the nice thing about this learning exercise is that they haven't had to leave anyone behind in the process. All of the original devices update. 
Yeah. It's pretty so incredible. It's been good. It is. It really is. Um, let's close on one last story. And the last story that I have here is that there are five new Macs, four new iOS devices coming soon, according to Russian regulatory filings. So data gleaned from regulatory filings in Russia suggests that Apple's going to announce at least five new Mac models and four new iOS devices at some point in the future. Um, well, that's what happens, <laughs> Well, you know, the story, <laughs> the story we have here says at, at some point as possibly as soon as WWDC. I'm kind of hedging my bets on that a little bit based on our earlier discussion. But when, when you get to the point where you're filing regulatory filings, it's because you have the device pretty much ready to go. Right. Right. Well, we know they're coming out. They've already announced that they're coming out with new iMacs this year. Yes. And probably a Mac Mini, I guess. I thought they might let that go, but apparently it said that it was kind of an important product. It, d- so that despite would be... what... All of you guys, everyone that's been on the podcast with me has told me that the Mac Mini should be abandoned, that people should just use laptops instead. And I... I don't think know... it should. I think I just thought it wasn't <laughs> important enough to keep going. I mean, I didn't think they were selling that many. Well, I, I know a number of people who are holding out waiting for a new one. And in the end, I had to advise them to just go ahead and buy the existing model because there was enough, you know, it, it, there wasn't enough surety that there was a new one coming and it was beginning to be difficult to run, uh, well, to do much of anything on, on the old operating system. They were using 10.6 and Snow Leopard is a cool operating system, but the, the internet has changed since then. And Safari doesn't keep up with modern sites. Um, you know, there, there, there became version mismatches for software. It, it became a difficult thing for them to continue to use. Basically, a computer that was pushing 10 years old, 12 years old. And so, um, you know, I moved them over to a 2013 Mac Mini and, and set them up on that, which will be good for a long time. But it's not the same as if they'd been able to run out and get a brand new one and be good for that much longer. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it, what they how they plan to keep that going. Yeah, and you know, position as a product because when it originally came out, it was kind of like here's a replacement for that PC you have. Get rid of the box mm-hmm. and you use your the same keyboard and mouse that you were using. Yeah, um, but there's I think there's there's less people who have a computer sitting on their desk at home. I, I would agree with you, but in in every case, the people that I know that are using the Mac Mini are the the sort of elderly segment. They're they're people who don't view themselves as using an iPad as a computer. They like the idea of having the computer at the desk and using it in the way that they've always used a computer. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in in this sort of sixty year old and older segment. That's possible. That that segment also is like really. If you look at who's using iPods, it's young people and older people. Mm-hmm. So that may also change too. I don't know. So are, yeah, it's the people who are however old now used to using a PC get older. But definitely. Well, I'm I'm looking at these filings. The filings don't have any really solid data behind them, although we we can tell which operating system these devices are going to use. It's um, it's not clearer than that, what they are. So we don't know if it's an iPad Pro, we don't know if it's an iOS, but it, you know, it could be MacBooks. We're not entirely sure. Um, the numbers seem to indicate that they could be iPad Pros and they could be MacBook Pros, but it's just not positive. The, uh, the reason that this filing even exists is because Russian laws require these sort of filings in order to comply with encryption registration. Um, it's there, there aren't any release dates listed, but it seems unlikely that Apple would put out new model numbers for these kinds of products a long time before the actual release, right? Apple wouldn't let out that there's going to be an A1701 for months before they actually release. It's, it's uncharacteristic, I would say. And, and those are the kinds of things we have. We have model numbers, A1289, A1347, and so forth for the different devices that this filing has. So um, that's why uh, it, it could be as soon as WWDC. Yeah, it's getting close. We'll know, we'll know on Monday. We'll know next week, won't we? <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, is there anything else you'd like to discuss before we go? 
Um, I can't think of anything. It'll be exciting to be at WWC and um, hope to see a lot of people there. There's, we'll do a, like a podcasting session there. They have a a setup to do podcasts. Hopefully, we can get a spot. Yep. Well, we'll we will do the podcast, and you and I are also going to do the live stream, as we have in years past. Will be exciting. It's, it's the first time it's been in San Jose in, in at least a very long time. I don't. I've never been to it in San Jose. Or I'd never been, I've only rarely been to San Jose. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Dan, where can people find you on the internet? I'm on Apple Insider all the time and on Twitter at Daniel Aaron, E-R-A-M. And I'm your host, Victor Marks. This has been episode 123, and we will join you back next week for WWDC News. <laughs>